a student sheet I'm going to pass out to you. And uh, I want you all to take one of these. And there's a couple of places you're going to be filling in some information. You, can, you don't have to fill it. You can read it. I hope I got enough here. Let me just give you guys one for now and see if we got enough. Mm -hmm. Anybody need a pen, pencil? No, you can have one. Okay. I got two left. Bobby? Oh, you got one? Okay. Praise the Lord. Okay, well now we're back. Okay, tonight we're going to be starting Lesson 10. And um, we're talking about the complete mention principle. That's what we're going to be sharing on tonight. And... Um, what that's all about. I want you to know that Vicki is a diligent student of the word. I asked her to go home. I asked you all to go home and find the scripture where it says God is, loves sinners but hates sin. And she went Super Bowl Sunday all day in her Bible in her room the other night or whatever it was and she was searching her heart out for that Scripture, and she came Monday night, and Lisa, Lisa said to her, don't you know Pastor Bob by now that there's no such scripture? But uh, she was diligent to get into the Word, and that was good. I don't know if anybody else going to scriptures and look for it. I don't think so. So she gets uh, a round trip. No. She's going on a cruise in a, another month or so, so. Praise God. I know, huh? That's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I didn't ask Pastor if he wanted to go, but that's all right. <laughs> what goes around comes around, she says. All right, the complete mention principle. And what is the complete mention principle? Well, the complete mention principle is defined as that principle by which the interpretation of any verse is determined upon a consideration of the complete mention of its subject in the scripture, it's very, very close to um, the first mention principle. It's very close to that. And there are different ways of saying this. Um, as a matter of fact, the true Bible doctrine consists of everything that the Bible says about a particular topic. So when you do a, when you do a Bible study or you do a word study, you want to make sure that you get all of the angles of that particular one word. You want to be able to look it up and find out what's the definition. Um, many of you have a concordance now. Many of you have a dictionary now, um, and there's different things that you can do to get even deeper. If you want to get deep, I mean, you know, the Word of God is like an ocean. You can dive into it, and, and you can really spend hours upon hours in researching, and uh, I, I don't want to say the word excavating, but it's kind of like digging out. It's kind of like an excavation, you know, and just kind of dig out and dig out and dig out truth. And, and I can tell you, you can stay on one word. I stayed on one word for six hours one time. Just on one word, searching it out, finding out where the root meaning of it came from. And, and, and you know, it just takes you down that road, and you just get so in, in, in infatuated with those things. Uh, you do not have a full grasp of God's mind on the subject until you have listened to everything that he has to say about it. So before we perform a doctrine or we make a doctrine, you've got to make sure that you have all of the scripture concerning that one issue. Um, you know, people take a scripture out of context, and we've talked about that many times. Um, like Galatians 3.28, there's neither male nor female, and they make a big doctrine out of that without any of the other uh, aspects of teaching on that particular subject. So you have to make sure you take everything in context, and you also take everything in accordance with uh, what other books of the Bible say or what other chapters say, what other verses say in that particular matter. 
And when you're studying a particular idea, object, event, or person, studying every passage in the Bible that refers to that subject should be investigated. You should make sure that you're doing your best because 2 Timothy says what? Study to show yourself approved unto God. That's not just Paul to Timothy, a pastor, but that's for every Christian. You know, to study to show yourself approved unto God. You have to study, and you have to take the time, and you have to put the effort in. And how many know that when you study, it's work. It's, it's not just leisure. I mean, you know, it's, it's really work. You've got to really search. But, you know, today the tools are so much easier to use than they were years ago. I remember when we first studied, that's why I have such a large library. Well, most of my library is available in book form on the computer. And now you don't have to have a, a, a vast amount of library and space in your home. You can go right on your computer. But some people like to hold the book. And I know my wife does, and I do too at certain times. I like to hold that book and just, you know, be able to write in it and, and do things. Um, and, but it's very handy on the computer because you can uh, also take inserts out of it and put it into Word, and you can highlight it. And what's good about the Logos, Logos program, it's a little expensive, but uh, I remember years ago you all bought it for me for pastor appreciation. And I've got that on my computer. And I, I, I have thousands of, no, not thousands, maybe about uh, several hundred volumes on that, um, on that program. And what's nice, if you take a phrase out of it and you want to you wanna quote that phrase, it automatically puts the footnotes in where it came from, the page it's on, all that stuff, the author. So that's pretty neat. So you can, there's so many tools out there that you can get and you can use and utilize when you're, you're doing this. And so um, no single verse relevant to any specific sub subject can be left out in formulating the doctrinal teaching on that subject. And uh, each relevant verse is an integral part of the whole, supplementing, adding to, or clarifying, or illuminating the others. Um, so first of all, we understand what is the complete mention principle. <clears throat> Second of all, number two, why is the complete mention principle so important? Why is it so important? The uh, complete mention principle is important for at least three reasons that we've, we've come up with. Number one, and this is where you might want to fill in uh, the blank. Okay, the complete mention principle is important because of the fact of what? Progressive revelation. Remember how we talked about that, how things progress and you get the better meaning at the end? Sometimes when you're trying to look for the meaning... So you have to look through that progression, and you can't just take one section of that out and come up with a conclusion. You have to look at the whole picture of that progression of revelation. When we talked about that in Genesis, and we talked about you know, the snake on the pole and stuff like that, and what was the significance of that, and how false doctrine came out of that in the church and the, and the hyper-faith movement saying that Jesus became satanic on the cross. That's ludicrous. Jesus didn't become satanic on the cross. That was God judging the serpent on the cross, and, and that judgment defeated him and, and, and killed him. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's crazy doctrine. But you see how the doctrine can be taken out of con the scripture can be taken out of context and make it, make it say whatever you want it to say. So the complete mention principle is important because of the fact of progressive revelation. The word you want to put there is progressive. And you need to think of God's revelation to man on a timeline. God does things on a timeline. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, when God first approached man and said, where are you? It wasn't because God was stupid. It wasn't because God didn't have the knowledge of where Adam was. It was because God was giving Adam the opportunity to own up to what he did. And what did he do? He shifted the blame over to his wife. Then the wife shifted the blame over to the serpent. Okay. Um, and again, because of that, I lost my train of thought. I'll get it back. The principle of first mention uh, is uh, uh, of um, the complete mention of principle, rather, is got to stay the same all the way through Scripture, and it helps you to get a better revelation of what it's at. Um, B, the complete mention principle is important because the rest of the, what the Bible says often brings what to the particular passage being studied. What does it bring? It brings balance. It brings balance. 
If only the verse that you read about God indicates that God is a consuming fire. Let's say that you read that scripture in Hebrews 12.29. Let's say if you read that, that God is a consuming fire, you might have only one attitude toward God. You might think he's just fire. However, you further study, upon further study, you realize that God is also love, he's also light, he's spirit. It will balance out your concept and give you more proper understanding of who God is. Let me illustrate this in the relation to Jesus and his personality. Jesus is the example of perfect balance in ministry. John 1.14 And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse indicates that Jesus was full of grace and truth. That is, he was filled fully with grace, but at the same time he was filled fully with truth. So he's not one at the, co at the expense of the other. He's both. As you study any particular scripture verse, you may lean one way or another in your view of Jesus. However, after you look at the broader picture, you can develop a true biblical viewpoint. So in other words, let's take for an example. Um, you know, today you go on the internet, uh, you go to these seeker-friendly churches, and you read about them. It's all Jesus loves, 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 loves. And if you go to some of the... Um, what I call the uh, motivational speaker churches, where the pastor is just a motivational speaker, comes out, gives a little sermon out, 20 minutes maybe, you know, 25 minutes, gets you a little bit encouraged, gets you your best life now and stuff like that, and then, uh, then takes you and, you know, gives you a little pat on the bum and says, okay, go home. Well, because they want to portray Jesus as one who loves and is not condemning or anything like that. That's one side of Jesus. The other side of Jesus is this. You vipers, hypocrites, sons of the devil. <laughs> okay? There's another side to Jesus, okay? You make them twice the sons of hell, and you're, and you're apostolizing, apostolizing them, trying to make them become Jews and circumcised in the whole nine yards. He came right out and he, he, he told them. Right? Okay, so... There's another side. So you can't just take one side, and that's what people are doing today. They're just taking one side of Jesus. They're not taking the full revelation of who he is uh, because they don't, want a, they don't want that Jesus. They want the, the nice stroke, nice, you know, treat me good, treat me kind, you know, the millennial Jesus, you know. You know the, the, if, you, if he says anything to you or tries to spank you, you've got to go in your, in, your, in, your, in your closet for an hour or two to try to get peace and restoration and stuff. Uh, that's crazy. Jesus exemplified grace. That is, he was the kind, compassionate, forgiving minister of mercy. Um, Jesus reached out to the un untouchable. You see that in Mark 1, 40, verse 40 to 41. Remember, the leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was moved with compassion. Okay? So Jesus did that. Jesus extended uh, forgiveness to the adulteress. You know, he's, he's kind, he's compassionate, but if you keep on doing what you're doing and you have no desire to change, you know, you can't rely upon this compassionate Jesus on the day of judgment. So, he was also uh, moved by compassion for, and for a bereaved widow. Remember that in Luke 7, 12 to 15? I'm not going to go through all these and read them all, but, you know, it's there. Uh, Jesus freely ministered to the demon-possessed people in Mark chapter 5 verses 1 to 19. Jesus disregarded his own personal need and he touched the sick. In Matthew 14, I'll read that one. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. And when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out and he saw the great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. So one of the characteristics of Jesus is putting others before himself. So don't ever say you're like Jesus or you want to be like Jesus if you're more concerned about selfishness and your own self. Because that's not a characteristic of Jesus. That's a characteristic of the flesh. If you think more highly of others and you, you treat others more highly than yourself, that's the characteristic of Jesus. Was Jesus tired? Of course he was. He was a man. He got tired. He got weary. 
And he went up into a mountain to get away from all the pressing crowds. And you imagine people always reaching for you, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. My son's got a demon, pray, pray that demon out. And he goes and prays the demon out. Come on, heal me, I need a healing, I need this, I need that, I need this. I need... And, then you got, and I'm not talking one or two, you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people pressing in on you. So he goes away to a mountain to, to rest. And what happens? They get wind of where he is, and they all come running in. And he goes out there and looks. He could have just said, hey, look, office hours are from 9 to 5. Okay? Right? Think about it, if Jesus did that with you. You know, at 6 o'clock at night, you had an emergency, and you called Jesus, and it says, we're sorry, there's no one in the office right now. Please call back tomorrow. <laughs> How would you feel? You would be saying, man, you don't care. I mean, you know. No, but he was there 24-7, and here he, he was there, and these people come running, he had compassion, he went out and he healed them. So Jesus shows genuine concern for the natural needs of people. Uh, Jesus was moved by the need of shepherding of fainting and weak people. In Matthew 9.36 says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. So he was, he was always moved with compassion. That's another characteristic of Jesus. He was moved with compassion. Are you moved with compassion? When you see somebody? When you see somebody stinky and smelly, are you moved with compassion or are you moved with you know, disdain? Ooh. Ooh. What do you move by? Are you moved with compassion for that person? These are things uh, that we're going to be learning about. Uh, Jesus rebuked cities and villages. How about that? Uh, let me back up for a minute. At the same time, Jesus exemplified truth. That is, he was, uh, he was the rebuking, correcting, and cleansing minister of justice. You see that in Luke 17.3. Look, just put that up there for me, brother. Luke 17.3. It says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, uh, encourage him, lift him up, you know, uh, tell him how wonderful he is, uh, you know, uh, encourage him, uh, put your arms around him, make him feel uh, that not threatened at all. But isn't that the kind of Jesus would preach? Not us, but there are churches that are preaching that kind of Jesus. No, Jesus said, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. <laughs> and if he repent, forgive him. Jesus rebuked cities and villages, Matthew eleven twenty 20 to 24. Now Jesus, I'm going to read it from the message, okay? Now Jesus let fly on the cities where he had worked the hardest, but whose people had responded the least? shrugging their shoulders and going their own way. This is what he told them. Doom to you, Chorazin. Doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had seen half of the powerful miracles you have seen, they would have been on their knees in a minute. At Judgment Day, they'll get off easy compared to you. And Capernaum, with all your peacock strutting, you are going to end up in the abyss. If the people of Sodom had... Your chances, the city would still could uh, the city would still be around at Judgment Day. They'll get off easier compared to you. Huh. Wow! Does that sound like the Jesus that's being preached a lot across the the airways in a lot of ministries today? No, but that's a, that's who he is. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. Jesus drove out the money changers. See, that's why we've got to have, we've got to have a, the whole picture. That's why we've got to have all of the complete mention principle about a subject. And I'm just giving you these examples so that you can see them. Number three. What are some of the hurdles to overcome relative to the completion mentioned principle? What are some of the hurdles to overcome relative to the complete mention of principles? Well, this is another place where you're going to have to fill in. It says, perhaps the most significant hurdle is being willing to do the work. 
It takes work. Opening the books, looking, researching, finding out information that is involved in looking at all the verses. Sometimes, you, if you have a strong concordance, and if you don't have one, they're very inexpensive, about like $10. A strong concordance has every single word in the Bible. So if you look up the word, um, if you look up the word uh, salvation, it'll give you all of the verses where the word salvation is located in every Bible passage where you can find it. And that's the way that you can find it. See, years ago, when we didn't have those tools, you had to go through the Bible. And you had to look through every page and every column to see that you could find that word. And that would take hours and hours and hours and hours to do. Now you have a book. You just open it up, look up the one word. You can find all of the Greek numbers right there, and you can follow the, go right back into the Greek in, the middle, in, in a matter of 5 or 10, 15 minutes. The tools are there. And it's, it's sad because people don't use the tools. You know, it's like God's provided, God's provided a, a chainsaw, and we're still using a handsaw. And we're trying to cut through a 10-foot log. <laughs> and, and we just, and God says, what are you doing? Use the chainsaw. It's the, it, these, these tools are available, and they're not expensive. You can go on the Internet. There's di different Internet sites you can go on, and, and you, can, you can look up things. Uh, one of them is, um, I'm trying to think of, the Blue Bible. It's called the Blue Bible. It's an excellent, excellent site. And it's free, and you can go on there. They have all commentaries. They have all kinds of lexical aids. They have all kinds of dictionaries. It's all there available and free of charge. You can go in, and you can do those things yourself. You know, there are... In some things, this, it's easy task because there's only maybe a few references. You know some some references, but un, you know unfortunately there are many themes that are represented by a few hundred verses. Okay, so topics like prayer, the kingdom of God, holiness, uh, righteousness, purity, sin, wickedness, repentance are vast. Other topics like minstrels, frankincense, conscience, foot washing, only have a small number of verses. So again, it depends on which subject matter you're looking at. What is the process for applying the complete mention principle? Another place you'll fill in. A, you discover the other verses that relate to your topic. You look for the other verses that relate to your topic. Um, put up there for me, if you will, Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. You know the story. It's about Enoch. Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, and he begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. Wow. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Isn't that amazing? Right to our calendar, 365. 365 years. And it says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So let's stop there for a moment. God took him. Now, means he could have died. If you had just this one scripture, it would, you could say, well, he died, right? God took him. You know how many times you go to a funeral, oh, God took him. Okay. God took him. What did he do with him? Where did he go? Okay. What happened to him? So if you had just this one verse, you would still have a lot of unanswered questions. Right? So you have to go through the scriptures and find out if there's anywhere else that Enoch is mentioned. Right? Does anyone know where, anywhere else where he's mentioned?
Very interesting. The Old Testament gives us the, the story, gives us what they, he was, we walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Those questions go all over. Where did he go? How did he go? What was the, did he die? Is he alive? Well, now go to Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. This is what I'm talking about, progressive revelation. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So now, in the, in the New Testament, we have a further revelation, a progressive revelation of Enoch and what happened to him. So the writer of the Hebrews, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this and says, because uh, they're talking about the, the, what they call the Hall of Faith, right? And it says, by faith, Enoch was translated. So he knew that. God revealed that to him. So he was translated. He didn't see death. So it's not a speculation. It's not an assumption. Uh, gee, uh, that scripture could mean that, you know, that God took him. It could mean that, you know, there was still a little vagueness there. But now in light of, of Hebrews 11.5, there's no question you know what that scripture means. That he didn't die. That God translated him. God took him up to heaven. Okay, He didn't see death and was not found because God had translated him. Now, is there a possibility that he's seen anywhere else in Scripture? There's a probability, I'll, I'll put it that way, in Revelation, with the two witnesses, okay, and people believe one of them is Enoch, or Elijah. Okay, some say it's Moses, but I don't believe so because Moses died. Okay, so Enoch didn't die. Elijah didn't die. He was translated. So these two witnesses that appear on the Jerusalem streets and they're preaching, Jesus. It says then they were killed and their bodies laid in the ground, for laid out for everyone to see for three days. And people rejoiced over that. They gave presents and gifts. They rejoiced over that. But on the third day they were raised up and they were taken up to heaven. The only two people that I know that hadn't died was Enoch and, e and Elijah. For it is appointed unto man to. So we can have that. We can, we can put that there. We don't make a doctrinal stand on it and say that's definitely it, but it very well possibly could be that. Amen? So this you will cross reference concordances, tropical Bibles, and uh, topical Bibles, and Bible dictionaries. One of the best topical Bibles you can get is the Thompson Chain. The Thompson Chain Bible is one of the best Bibles you can get because it has a chain reference, and the chain reference takes you from the Scripture, and it shows you other places where that same meaning of Scripture is. It makes it a little bit easier um, to do that. Isn't that neat how that works? Mm -hmm. What are some, uh, well, let's see. What does this verse, I'm going to fill in another blank. Look up the verse and ask yourself questions relative to each new verse. What does the verse add to an understanding of this concept? What does it add? What did that scripture add in Hebrews 11.5 that you didn't have in Genesis? It had the answer to what happened to him. Okay, so it added information. Okay, God took him. Okay, that's great to know. Yeah, okay, but how did he take him? Did he kill him? Did he bury him in the desert? Did he, 
hide his body? No, it added Hebrews eleven five adds to the to the definition of what happened. He explains what happened. He was translated. He didn't see death because before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So it, it, it's it's. <laughs> And then the second thing is, the next, next one you'll fill in is, what blank of this concept does this verse emphasize? Or what facet of this verse, concept, does this verse emphasize? It emphasizes that he walked with God before he was translated, and that's the reason why he did get translated. Now, if you do a study, if you do a study on the words of Jesus when he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Right? And he talks about how the moon will turn to blood and the sun will lose its, its you know, Matthew 24. If he said, as it was in the days of Noah, well, in the days of Noah, uh, Enoch was... Noah's great great grandfather. Okay. So if it was as the days of Noah, when the Son of Man comes, the second coming, what what transpired before the flood? Before God's judgment? Was the taking up of Enoch. Can we, can we then look at that and say it's possible before the second coming that those who walk with God, he's going to rapture? It's possible. Very interesting, right? Again. What are some of the examples of the complete mention principle? If you look at the word contentment, You'll see a Greek number, 714, 841 to 842. That's in your Strong's Concordance. So if you go in your Strong's Concordance when you get home and you look it up, when you have a chance, and for the sake of time, we'll just focus on the New Testament here, okay? There are two main words that are rendered content or contentment in the New Testament. The Greek word, aq, number 714, which literally means to ward off, to avail, or to be satisfactory. It is translated, be content, be enough, suffice, be sufficient. In B, there are two Greek related Greek words, autokaria and uh, autakis uh, come from the above word and literally mean self-satisfied, contented, and content. And these words are translated contentment, sufficiency, and content. But there are 11 verses in the New Testament that use these words. Okay, so let's look them up in order to see what each verse adds to our understanding of this concept. Look at Matthew 25, verse 7 to 9. I'm only going to take a couple of these because we can't go through all of them. And then he says, Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answer, saying, No, lest there should not be enough. For us and you, but go rather to, to those who sell and buy for yourselves. There's not enough. There's not enough. That, so it, it means to the place of um, sufficiency. So it's going to be a little bit different meaning. Just like uh, I think it's in First Peter chapter 2 or Second Peter chapter 2. I'm not sure. I think it's First Peter chapter 2. It's just coming in my head now. Where it says, wise... Submit to your own husbands, okay? That they will be one without a word by your, by your, what's that? By your chaste conversation. And if you look at today's meaning of the word conversation, you think it means dialogue. But it doesn't. It means by your behavior, how you behave. So see, if you just read the English version of that, and you say, by your conversation, 
You know, that means that you're going to keep getting on your husband, getting on your husband to get saved, getting on your husband to get saved, getting on your husband to get saved. That's not what it means. It means by your lifestyle, how you live, being a godly wife, you know, holding your values, putting God first, and not re re relenting that, and they see your commitment, they see your love for God, they see your love for Jesus, they see God in your life, they're going to want what you got. Right? All right, let's see. No, I don't want to go through all of these. Uh, Hebrews 13.5. I'll touch on that one. It's already 8 o'clock, if you can believe it. Hebrews 13.5. He says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. <clears throat> be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Sometimes we live without contentment because we focus on what we do not have rather than on what we have. I'll say that again. Sometimes we live without contentment because we focus on what we do not have rather than on what we have. Those who constantly dwell on what they do not have are most likely not giving thanks for what they do have. They are not counting their blessings. Real contentment is not dependent upon poverty or wealth, but on an inner attitude of the spirit. A man who is not content with little, with little will not be content with much. And that's the truth. Rockefeller, who was one of the richest men in the world at one time, someone asked him, said, Mr. Rockefeller, how much is enough? You know what his answer was? Just a little bit more. Think about it, he had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And he asked the question, how much is enough? Just a little bit more. That's not contentment. So contentment's not based upon how much you have or you don't have. It's an inequality of being thankful for what you have. And the secret to being prosperous in God, and I believe this, is to be content. For contentment with godliness is great gain, the Bible says. To be content to know and thank God for what you do have and not complaining and moaning and groaning of what you don't have. That, that will go a long way in your walk and your spiritual growth with Christ. It doesn't matter what you don't have. It just matters that God is with you. Like it says, I am with you, I am with you and I'm your helper. And I, and I, will, it's, I will not leave you. So we, we both say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. You don't have to fear. Real contentment is not dependent upon poverty or wealth, but on the inner attitude of the spirit. And a man who is not content with little will not be content with much. He'll want just a little bit more. And actually, if we understand what we have as believers, we should see that we are indeed prosperous. <clears throat> Some of you came with me to Guatemala. And some of you saw the dump. And some of you saw people living in the dump. And I remember when, um, when um, Carolyn and Jen was on the plane and we were coming back, they were crying and they were saying, I'm getting rid of all my stuff and I'm, you know, I'm going to give it away, and I'm going to take the money and you know, I'm, uh, sell it and give it the money away. I'm like, whoa, 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 hold it. You've got to get debriefed. Okay? <laughs> they do. You have to get debriefed when you come back from a mission field because that's what your heart is. You want to do that. You, want to, you don't care about things anymore. When you see how, how bad off other people are and how they live, what you have and what I have, we are rich. We are blessed. When you, walk into a, when you walk into a hut, like I have in India, you walk into a hut 
and all they have for a floor is dirt. And all they have is two rooms. One room that's where they sit, they eat, okay? They wash the dishes, they wash their clothes. Everything is in that one room, and then the other room, they all sleep in the same room together. Five or six people in a little tiny room. And I say a little tiny room, I'm saying maybe eight by ten. You got five people in there. And they're on the floor on mats. They don't have comfort beds and, and uh, what's that, uh, sleep number beds and the, the things going up and down. They don't have any of that stuff. No. They're sleeping on a little thin mat on the ground where bugs go and everything goes and little kids, you know, and, and they all sleep together in that one room. Or oh, when, when you see, like I did when I went to India, and you see a, a little boy tossing a Tupperware cover and with a rip in it. And he's tossing it like a Frisbee all over, and he's running after it. And happy as a clam. I mean, happy, happy as anything. He's playing with this thing, and he's tossing it up in the air, and he's running, trying to catch it and all this stuff. And I said to him, I said, what's he doing? They said, oh, he's happy because that was his Christmas present. That's what he got for Christmas was a torn cover. It was about that big, Tupperware cover. It was torn. It was like cut. And he was playing with that. And, and it, it makes you stop and think. And when Linda and I was out to breakfast one time, around Christmas time one time, and we heard a waitress saying, oh, oh, i, I got to get out of here. i got to go shopping for my kid. I already spent $700. i got another 700 to go. And I just think of that little kid with that Tupperware. And how happy he was. Sometimes giving our kids everything they want, That doesn't make them happy. A man is not measured by the possessions which he owns. You're not successful if you own a house and you have a brand new car. That doesn't make you successful. What makes you successful is when you can lay your head down at night and you have integrity and character. That's what success is. When you can know you've done things honestly. See, so all these things, what I'm trying to tell you is, all these things about these... The principles here of the complete mention principle is that you want to be able to take the fullness of something and get a fuller revelation of that. Like uh, shepherds. Did you know by the, the Jews, the Pharisees, they despised shepherds because they thought they were all thieves and, and crooked? You can understand the disdain now of a Pharisee when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. Shepherd. Wanderer. Wandering everywhere. You're a shepherd. Messiah of Israel. Because he was known as Jesus the Christ. Or Yahshua. Hamashiach. Messiah. Christ is Messiah. Christ isn't his last name. Christ is Messiah. Anointed one. You're a shepherd. And then come to the conclusion where he says, I am the door. If you take it literally, he's hallucinating. He must be on drugs. He said he's a door. If I came to you and said, I'm a door, <laughs> you'd be laughing. He said, I'm a door. I am the door of the sheep. Anyone that would come in any other way are thieves and robbers. Tell that to Oprah. Getting the fuller revelation of what he's saying. If we understand what we have to, as believers, we should see that we are indeed prosperous. If someone is, pros proper, uh, if someone is pros prosperous and successful, it means many things, including the following. Number one, having godly offspring. If you have godly offspring, you're blessed. Because I'll tell you, if you don't have godly offspring, it can be hell on earth. Sometimes Linda and I, we, we see parents and what they go through and we go, thank you, Jesus, we don't have children. 
Okay, but we have spiritual children, and we go, oh, Lord Jesus, please help them. <laughs> uh, having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're prosperous. If you think for one moment that if the world was to blow up right now through a nuclear explosion, you'd be ushered into the presence of Jesus. You know there are hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions, that on that day will go right straight to hell, a Christless eternity. You are prosperous. You are successful. Meeting godly goals in life. Experiencing rest from personal enemies. Having favor and high esteem before God and man. You see that problem? They're all scriptures here. You have them, I think. Having good friendships. Being free from bondage that enslaves. Knowing a deep and inner peace that, and rest in the spirit of God. Having physical health and strength. Having abundance of material goods. Having respect from those who know you. Having a long, enjoyable, and satisfying life. Having personal security for the future. Having contentment frees us from covetousness and fear of the future. That's just one example of the word contentment. So, see, you can take these words... And you can expound on them. You can, you can actually get so much more from these things. When you, when you really look into these things and you, and you see, wow, I didn't know about that. Wow, I didn't know about this. Look at how this opened up the door for this. Look at how that opened the door for this. Now, now you're starting to you really get the full picture of something. When you look at Jesus, don't just look at him as love. Yeah, he's love, but he's justice, he's righteous, he's holy. Oh, you've got to take all of the aspects of who he is. And you can't dissect them into pieces and just take the parts that you like and the parts that you don't like. You, you don't just take the commandments that you like that, that talk about prosperity and success and virtue and, and having money and, and having fame and fortune. You can't take that part without taking the other part. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Oh, and his righteousness. See the fullness of that? See, if we take it, the fuller meaning of things, like the, the, the preachers on TV, they'll tell you about, they all speak about prosperity, prosperity. You turn the TV on all you hear is about prosperity. Sow your seed, sow your seed, sow your seed. I'm so sick and tired of sowing seed. When I'm going to see harvest? Sow my seed, sow my seed. I want to see harvest. Okay, I, I sown the seed. Where's the harvest? Uh, just keep sowing your seed. Just keep sowing your seed. In other words, what they're saying is keep being stupid and send me your money. Okay? But there's so much more to that than just sowing your seed. But, I mean, if you, if you look at the whole picture of it, okay, what does God say? There's a progression Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Your heart's desire as being translated out of the world into the kingdom of his son, your whole desire should be the advancement of God's kingdom. Missions. Amen? Missions. Going up to a brother or sister who you know is struggling and uh, giving your $20 or your $10 or your $5 in a blessing. Okay. Seeking first the advancement of the kingdom and, and his righteousness. The other thing about seeking the kingdom is, is, is when you're seeking the kingdom, it's not just to go there and ask God for stuff. It's not just to, to talk about your needs. That's supplication and prayer. But seeking the kingdom is, God, I want to be more like you. Reveal in me. Let your light shine in me. Show me the areas of my life that I'm not like you. Show me the areas I need to turn over to you. Show me that through the cross I have victory. Show me that I can walk in newness of life. Let, let me walk in the Spirit so I don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. God, that's seeking the kingdom first. And his righteousness. And when you do all of that, all those other things will be added to you as, as you need them. Not just added to you. 
That's where people get mess, messed up. They think it's just going to automatically all come. You're going to get houses and boats and cars. and uh, No, 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 no. As you have need. Because he said, I'll meet all of your need, not all of your greed, according to my riches and glory. Right? So you're, he's going to meet your need. And as you continue seeking his kingdom first and, 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 and identifying with him and spending time with him, you know, pouring out your love like we sang that song, pour my love to you, Lord. As you do all of those things first and you seek his righteousness, his righteousness is doing things right, making right decisions, walking in the spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. All of those things that God commands us, as you're doing those things, then you'll get wisdom. Then you get wisdom. One of the, uh, I was talking with somebody today, they were saying one of the hardest things to, to receive is discernment. And that can be true, that, but that can be not true. Because if you're listening to the Spirit, not, not the flesh, if you're listening to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to lead and guide you into all truth. You know, and if, if, you, if you listen and you go according to what the Spirit wants, there's blessing. But when you go out of that, and you walk in your own way, now you're in a problem. Now you're going to be in situations. So it's always best. So, again, that's just one subject matter that you can look at in the Bible as far as having the, um, the complete mentioned principle. Uh, like I said, one of the best examples was Enoch. He, he, he walked with God, and then he wasn't. Well, what happened to him? How did it happen to him? Why did that, that happen to him? Did he die? So if you were reading the Bible for the first time, those would be some of the things you probably would think of. Where did he go? God took him. Where did God take him? Did God take him to another country? Did God take him, you know, to another land? Did he translate him to another place? Uh, where did he go? Now the progression of Revelation in love, uh, Hebrews 11.5 tells us exactly what happened that he was translated, that God took him, that he would not see death. Because before his translation, he had this testimony that he walked with God. So take that scripture, walk with God, and, and investigate that. Research that. Look at that. What is, what is involved? Ask these questions. What's involved with walking with God? Let me throw that out to you in closing. Give me some answers. Give me some feedback. What, what is walking, what's some of the elements of walking with God? Like Enoch walked with God. What were some of the characteristics that he had? Obedience, of course. What else? Huh? Is what? Common? Oh, his commitment. Okay. His faithfulness? Okay. What else? Prayer, conversation with God? What else? See how everybody's adding something? What what else? Righteousness? What else? Thankfulness, contentment, yeah. What, see, see, now you're getting a fuller picture of what it means to walk. Well, what else? This is what you can do sitting down, talking to yourself, because you talk to yourself every day, probably. Okay? Okay. What else? Faith? Well, what else? All, all, yes, honesty. What else? Good one, honesty. What else? There's no way you can walk with God without this one word. It's called humility. Think about it. Because God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. So he had to have humility. Now see, all of us, we added to the meaning of that. Walking with God. But it can go deeper. You can go deeper. You know, when you go out fishing on a boat, you can take your line, you can just 
as it is and just drop it on the side there and you'll only be this much in the water. You can go deeper. You take it off, you let that thing go down, 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 and boop, hits the bottom of the sink and the, the, here's the, here's the uh, hook floating a little bit. You crank it a little bit and you just sit there. You can go deeper with the things of God. There's so much more that we don't know. But if you look at it, everybody had something to impart about walking with God. What does it mean? Okay, relationship, prayer, righteousness, okay, uh, contentment, all of those things. And you can do that too when you sit down and you begin to look at the whole principal mention of it and you go, wow, now I understand. Walk with God. Yeah, okay. Now, in the light of that, how does that reflect on me? And that's what you want to do. You don't just want to do a study just to get information in your head so you can be a computer and just spit out information. No, you want to be able to take that information and say, now that I have this information, Lord, how does that reflect with me? Do I have all of these things? Am I pursuing all of these things? Am I walking with you? You know, you know they that are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. How am I led by the Spirit? How can you be led by the Spirit if you're, if you're full of your own will and your own ways? You can't, be, you can't walk in the Spirit. You can't be led by the Spirit. To be led by the Spirit means someone is leading you. But today, we're leading the Holy Ghost. We're not letting the Holy Ghost lead us. True, right? So then how do we fix it? How else? That's good. How, how, what else? Okay, continuously reading his word. Okay. What else? How do we, how do we, how are we led by the Spirit? What has to take place for us to be led by the Spirit? Huh? Yes. Crucifying the flesh. Ooh. That's painful. Crucifixion's not easy. It's not fun. It's painful. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. And coming into agreement with what has been done on the cross. And in, in, in applying that which was done on the cross so that you can walk in newness of life. And you can be led by the Spirit. It takes humility. It takes that humbleness. It needs to, the opposite of that is to reject pride and arrogance. Know-it-all spirit. All of those things. And when we push those things aside and say, God, here I am. Down on my knees again. And that's, see how you can do it? Take the full mention of that. Wow, that's just one little phrase I just came up with, walk with God. But see how deep you can go with it. Take it, run with it. Find out more information. Look up on, online about books about walking with God. I think there's one by Andrew Murray, if I'm not mistaken. Walking with God. I don't know if it was him or R.A. Tari. It was one of those two about walking with God. Watchman Nee might have one, walking with God. Think about that. Walking with God. What is it required to, to be walking with God? Walking. Not running. You know, when you run, you can only run so far. Then you go to rest. You can, you can go further walking than you can running because you exert yourself all at one time. That's why, you know, the story of the rabbit and the, and the, tur the, the, rabbit and the turtle? Oh, the, the, what was it, the rabbit and the hare? Huh? The tortoise and the hare, yeah. Right, the hare. You know, the tortoise. Yep. I'm going to make it. I'm going to do it. 
before you know it, the, the rabbit falls asleep because he's too tired, and here comes the hare. Yep, I'm going to do it. I'm going to win the race. I'm going to do it. I think it was Brother, brother um, Ed who always say the, the, the turtle always wins. Yeah, it would run around the tortoise and stuff like that, make fun of them. Yeah, see? Amen? Did you learn something tonight? Good. Yes? You go for it. Four B. Oh, two and three? Okay, four B, two and three. Uh, it's what facet, F-A-C-E-T, of this concept does this verse emphasize? And three is, does this verse adjust my overall perspective on the subject? You're welcome. Two C? I'm trying to look for 2C. Hold on a minute. 2C? Wait a minute. I, I might, might have a... Oh, okay, 2C. The complete mention principle is important because it helps you emphasize what God emphasizes. Well, emphasizes. In other words, sometimes God is emphasizing something on a subject that you're studying, and it, and it might not be what you're thinking. It might be something else that God's thinking. Okay, Alicia, what was your question? Okay. 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 <laughs> 